Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are back for another week of live shows with me, your host, Kev Baker, right here on The Kev Baker Show on tfrlive.com. Like I say, another week ahead of us, and what a way to kick it off tonight. Absolutely fantastic guest, fantastic topics, and we will get to him in just a moment. But it's a big day here for the family. I'm feeling rather old today. My son turned 17 years old. Nothing like that to really put your age into perspective. But yeah, I want to give my son Kevin a big, huge, massive shout out. Not that he listens to the show, because at 17, it's just not cool to be listening to this stuff. Especially when all his friends already kind of tease him because I'm on YouTube and stuff like that. But obviously, a very special day here in the Baker household and hopefully a very special day on the show because tonight ladies and gentlemen I'm rejoined by a returning guest and it's somebody that really blew me away the last time when he was on and I was really really appreciative of the fact that he reached out again he wanted to come back on share some of his knowledge his wisdom on some of the stuff that I can only speculate about so who am I talking about well for everyone out there you're in for a rare, rare treat because I'm joined by Brendan Drackler. And he's an astrophysics student at the Rochester Institute of Technology working to understand how we can detect the most dense and energetic objects in our universe, black holes and neutron stars. Now, he's also working to understand the fundamental structure of black holes and how we can learn more about them. Brendan has spoken on topics ranging from our own solar system to the nature of dark energy to supernova and many other things in between. Now, you can find out more information about Brendan over at his own website and he hosts his own podcast called The State of the Universe. And the website is thestateoftheuniverse.com. And without any further ado then, let's go to the man himself, Brendan. Welcome Thank back to the show. Thanks for the introduction, man. I love. I I had so much fun last time, and I would I could do this like once a day. I mean, my schedule certainly wouldn't appreciate it, but <laughs> I would. I Mentally, I would. I it was great. Yeah, I, I loved kind of geeking out with you, dude. This, like I said to you before the show, it's almost like a guilty pleasure for me having somebody like you on, because these are the topics that even if I wasn't on radio and I wasn't doing a show. I would really be keeping up to date with all of the things going on in space and the scientific realm. So I really appreciate the fact that you take time out to come and share some of your knowledge, some of the stuff that you've learned with us. And not only that, you really opened my eyes to the whole scientific community. Because like I explained last time, for people like myself, I probably get dubbed a conspiracy theorist. There seems to be this general kind of held misconception that scientists are very close-minded and they just repeat what they've been told in the past. However, you absolutely destroyed that false idea I had in my mind and probably a lot of the listeners as well. So I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on here and just being who you are, dude. Yeah, well, well, shout out first shout out to Kevin, 17, the big 17. He's almost as old as me. I know you, you I'm know. only 23. I wish so, I looked 23 again. I'm telling you, man. No, he's, uh, <laughs> he's six foot but, two and uh, probably about, uh, he's almost a foot taller than me now. I'm like a little munchkin compared to him, Brendan. Jeez. Yeah. But, but uh, I, I love doing this. You know, this is, this is great stuff. I love educating. And, you know, to be completely honest, Kev, you're, you and your, your audience are, can be correct at times. There can be closed minded scientists that exists. It exists in every single sect of the population, whether it be politicians, whether it be scientists, whether it be engineers, whether it be podcasters, right? There's always going to be people who are set in the mindset who just want to regurgitate the same information and never change their viewpoint, even in the face of new evidence. That exists all the time. It exists in every one. In fact, I have to fight it sometimes, you know, because your natural inclination is going to be to to stay with the same knowledge that you've always had. You know, it's because it's got you this far. The knowledge I have has got me to 24 years old. From an evolutionary standpoint, that's pretty damn good knowledge. 
It's kept me alive. I haven't been eaten by a tiger. I haven't died yet. I haven't gotten a car crash. So my knowledge must be pretty sound, right? So it's kind of against the the grain, if you will, to even change your mind. But I promise you that the scientific the scientific viewpoints of, of many, many people are very mendable. They change, and they change a lot. No, absolutely. And like I was saying, you do your own podcast. You have some really stellar guests coming on there, pardon the pun. How have you been doing lately on there, dude? How's it going? It's going real good. Uh, last month, I had a Dr. Priya Natarajan on, and she is a, is a superstar in the world of cosmology. She is a, a, is a real, a real the, the, really the only word I can use is superstar. I mean, she has been and done everything in the field of cosmology for years, decades. And uh, recently, she, she's been in the news. She was featured on Science Friday the other week. She's been on all these large podcasts because she made a prediction 20 years ago, a prediction about supermassive black holes. And that prediction was finally validated with observations just last month. So that's what, that's what I try to do. Kev, I try to do the same thing you do. I identify people who are making strides in society, particularly for me in science. And I try to interview them. I try to understand what it is that they're doing. And I try to present it in a way that everyone can understand and that everyone can get on board and that no one feels alienated and no one feels like they're being shoved to the side. Because that, Kev, is where real progress can be made, I think. No, absolutely. And, you know, you've inter interviewed some of really big names out there. And my dream interview would be Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk, we could talk about him all night, but he's got SpaceX, and obviously he's got big dreams about going to Mars. Now, Mars is one place that we want to speak about today. We've seen all of the footage coming back from the various rovers as well. And I want to ask you, you know, what is your opinion on whether there could still be life on Mars? I think in terms of life as – if we talk about intelligent life, there's almost certainly no intelligent yeah. life there, right? Unless it's somehow like burrowed underneath the polar ice caps and it's living deep underground. And, and I don't think that's the case, right? We would probably have to see them come out sometime, the Martians. Uh, but but nevertheless, you know, this topic of life on Mars has been a, a very hot topic. In fact, uh, in the early 1900s, a man by the name of Percival Lovell, I think – I don't know. Do you put the W, the V? Sometimes you pronounce the W as a V. Lovell, Lowell. I don't know. It depends on who, what what your name is, right? But but nevertheless, I think in Brazil the the V the Ws have a V sound. It's weird. I don't get it. But yeah, it's, Percival it's, Lovell, I'll say, uh, he was was doing ob observations of Mars, and he noticed these weird striations all over the surface. I mean, you can see these. You can pull up a picture of Mars right now. You can type in Mars striations, and you'll see these things, and. At the time, with very primitive knowledge, he hypothesized that they were canals, canals on the surface, and that the Martians used those canals to transport water. And for a long time, ever since then, essentially, we've had an infatuation with Mars. It's very similar to our own planet. It's at a very similar distance to our own planet. It has similar properties to our own planet. And so we've always been infatuated with it. Could it have life? Well, I think we're at a stage right now where we can say for sure it doesn't have it doesn't have intelligent life what's more interesting i think is what it used to be like because that that's really interesting what did mars used to be like because it it does have a very very clear evidence that there used to be running water on the surface and in fact we can are, we can see running water on the surface today it's just not the type of water that we think of it's not a lake it's not a river but we have we can see these striations on certain craters the Newton Crater is a really popular one, I believe is the name. And you can see, as the seasons change, that water begins to run down the slopes. Now, it's very, very salty water, very viscous water. And so it doesn't flow like you would typically think of water. Instead, we infer that it's there by the fact that the soil changes color. And every season it appears, these striations appear, and every season, when the winter comes, they disappear. When the summer comes, they appear. And what it likely is, Kev, is meltwater. There's meltwater underneath the soil. And keep in mind, the temperature of Mars, people don't realize this, but generally the temperature of Mars is pretty damn cold. We're talking negative 60 Celsius. Okay, that's cold. That's really, really cold. That's You're not living in that. But at the equator in the summertime, Mars can get up to 20 Celsius or 70 Fahrenheit. 
So feasibly, you it's not a barren wasteland. And you could imagine that there could be some form of simple cellular bacterium or organisms living in the soil still. It's perfectly feasible. Yeah, we've um, spoke on the show with many as a guest about what Mars may have been like in the past. And, you know, we see some structures like you talk about there, the potential for that one point flow in water. And what would you say then? Again, we're probably speculating here, Brendan, but what would you say happened to Mars to throw it into the state that it's in now? Is there any lessons perhaps that we could learn from the history of Mars? Yeah. First, I'll say the the one thing, and this seems to be the obvious one. This seems to be the one that most people agree on, the lack of atmosphere. Yeah. Mars has a, a 100 times thinner atmosphere than the Earth. Now, that is not good for temperature. The way, The reason the Earth is as hot as it is is because we have an atmosphere that can maintain heat. And in fact, it might be the thing, Kev, that your grandchildren one day uh, will be shaking their fist at because it will be the thing that ends up uh, – causing climate change is the fact that we have such a dense atmosphere, noticeable climate change that begins to really cause severe, severe repercussions on the earth. But that's a different topic for a different time. The point is the atmosphere is very thin. And so I, I've heard this, I've seen this in the literature a lot. What might happen, Kev, is you have water that evaporates, just like water on earth. You have a water cycle, right? But because the atmosphere is so thin, the water, it can escape the atmosphere when it evaporates into the upper le levels of atmosphere. It doesn't come back down as rain. Instead, it can break free from the planet because there's nothing holding it in. And so what might have happened is if you had an active water cycle on Mars, over time, water molecules evaporate into the upper atmosphere, and when they're in the upper atmosphere, they can very easily just escape the planet because Mars is, is not as big as Earth, which means the surface gravity isn't as severe, and the atmosphere isn't very dense. So there's nothing really holding it there. That's something that's been tossed around in the literature a lot, that if you did at one point have large oceans, they could have, over the course of millions or billions of years, have evaporated and then escaped the planet. And then that might very well be what happened. Now, there's still a ton of water on Mars, right? Trapped in the polar ice caps. There's a lot, a hell of a lot, like enough to cover the whole surface with, with like, I, geez, this number sounds wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway, because... Unlike some scientists, some scientists are boring, man, and they don't want to speculate and they don't want to sound dumb and they don't want to sound stupid. I'm okay sounding stupid. I'll do it all day. I am stupid half the time. But I think, and I think I remember reading this, correct me if I'm wrong, viewers, I'm sure you will, that if you were to melt all of the polar ice caps, you could cover the surface of Mars with with a one to two mile thick or kilometer, we could say, yeah. a one to two kilometer thick surface ocean now that's pretty incredible wow now back to where i started here elon musk colonizing mars is mars still in what would be regarded as the goldilocks zone of you know where it's just right for us to actually set up there what i'm getting at is do you think that humans can eventually live on another planet like mars and i say that because Obviously, if we were to colonize Mars and, say, two of the people working there were to have a child and the child was brought to term on Mars, the difference in the gravity alone would mean that coming back to Earth for that child probably wouldn't happen because our gravity is denser here. And also, the Schumann resonance that we have here on planet Earth, it's almost, in my mind anyway, I could be entirely wrong, Brendan, absolutely wrong, but it's almost as if we are tuned to life on this planet as opposed to elsewhere. Yeah, there's a lot of weird psychological things that will happen. One, one of them you pointed out, and this is a physical thing, the difference in gravity. That's a, that's a real thing, Yeah. right? We send, we send astronauts into low Earth orbit, into the space station, and they immediately notice it. In fact, one of the interesting things uh, that I remember reading as in regards to space health science in other words, studying how humans will do in space in terms of their physical health, is that what we found when we started sending at humans to low Earth orbit is that we don't actually have uh, our posture that we walk around with on Earth is is sort of forced upon us. The fact that we walk with our shoulders back, because when you put someone in in a zero in a zero G environment, 
and you allow them to walk naturally, the natural walking stance is sort of hunkered down, almost like an ape. And it's very interesting. And it, it helps you to understand where we evolved from, from apes. Because you can see when you, when you put someone, when they're not fighting the gravity, when they sort of just sit naturally and don't try to fight gravity, they hunker down like an ape and they walk really weird. And so there's all these little things that we, we, we don't quite understand and we don't quite know until we start doing it. And I think that there will be a lot of hurdles to jump through in that regard. You know, your, your example, yeah, it's going to be really weird for someone to have grown up on Mars – where the, the year is a lot longer or maybe the day is slightly different or whatnot or you don't get as much light as you do on the earth. And then to come here, it's going to be weird. It's going to be a, certainly an interesting thing. I mean you already have people who get affected by the seasons just by living here, right? The, the seasonal affective disorder I think it's called, seasonal depression. Hell, sometimes I get that. Like when there's not – when you don't get enough vitamin D, the sun's not out, it's winter time, the weather's shitty. It's not good. And so, yeah, that's something that we're going to have to to really fight with. It definitely uh, sounds there... like um, life in Scotland, Brendan. We, we get special yeah. bulbs you over get, here because what, we even you get, get one or two, yeah, one we... or two days of sun a day <laughs> if we're lucky, a year. If we're lucky, last year was glorious. It truly was glorious. It was like living in the tropics. But yeah, there's a vitamin D deficiency that we certainly suffer from over here. We can buy certain bulbs that can adjust for that seasonally adjusted disorder. And, you know, it's funny you bring that up because that's one aspect of things that I never even factored in to living on another planet, in this case, Mars. So that's obviously going to be an obstacle that people like Musk and anyone else planning to go there is going to have to get around. Yeah, when you when when you begin talking about bringing humans to whole new like planets, right, whole new areas and keeping them there for years, it's not like they're going to go there for two weeks and come back. I mean, these people are, are in some cases, they might live there, right? So w- what we're going to see, Kev, I think, is, is, is a, a human race that becomes incredibly reliant upon non-natural things. So th- in other words, we're going to have to live on supplements. We're going to have to live in technology. There's not going to be any going out and getting sun if you live on Mars, right? You're going to go to like light therapy, which already exists. You're going to stand in some weird, weird UV little tanning bed that that shines light on you all day so that you can get the necessary vitamin d production or or something weird it's hurdles that we're gonna have to jump through yeah undoubtedly absolutely now then we've dealt with the potential for life on mars but i think there's probably a far better and more viable option in our own solar system and that comes from one of the moons of saturn and we hear a lot about europa Brendan, what, what's your take on Europa? Because that's almost, you know, I think they've said if they could get down below the ice, then there's a good chance that we could find life there. Very much similar to Lake Voskov, I think it is, down in Antarctica, where there's the extremophiles that they find in places really that you don't expect to find life. Hmm. I, wanna, I want to uh, say one more thing about Mars, because yeah. I think it's really it's really interesting. One of the things about Mars that really make it a candidate for not being able to support life is the fact that it doesn't have a big moon. I didn't know this until recently. I was doing some research for a podcast that I was doing with Bernie Taylor, who you have ha- you've had on here. Brilliant guy. And and I was researching some literature regarding the moon. How important is the moon for human beings? And I'm sure he'll come on your show sometime and he'll talk about his his side of of his research. But for me, from the, a physical standpoint. The moon does something really important for us, Kev. Do you, do you know that the Earth is tilted? And that tilt is the reason we have cyclical s- summers and winters. Yes. Okay? If the Earth wasn't tilted, we wouldn't have a cyclical summer. It would always be cold at the equator – or at the at the poles. It would always be warm at the equator. I love the tilt, okay, because it does give me some warmth at some time of the year. But the moon stabilizes the tilt. The tilt varies over the course of, of many, many years. It goes between 22 and 24 degrees. It sits about average 23 degrees. And that variance in tilt is what causes a lot of the large-scale climate changes that we see, things like ice ages. Okay, The moon, if it wasn't there, the Earth would be tilting on plus or minus 10 degrees. And that would cause us to have ice ages on the order of once every 10,000 years. Humans probably wouldn't be here. 
Now, when we look at Mars historically, one thing we see, because it only has two small moons, Phobos and Deimos, it doesn't have a big stabilizing moon. It will vary between a 10 degree tilt and a 40 degree tilt. And that causes large scale changes in climate. I mean, Kev, you could have points in the history of Mars where the North Pole is literally facing the sun. Whoa. Okay. Now that's very chaotic. That's not a good place to live. And so that's another thing we're going to have to contend with as we as we begin to to colonize Mars in the future. So is this and I do we, believe that with, with for, Elon Musk and other private entities, we'll get there. We'll get there in my lifetime, yeah, undoubtedly. I absolutely believe that as well. I totally agree. Is this where we could almost make a case? Again, speculating, but if they're talking about maybe terraforming Mars or another planet, would you think some artificial moon kind of structure, if that's even possible, like a Death Star, I suppose I'm talking about there, but something to regulate that so you could almost negate what you're talking about there. Yeah, I'm not sure you could ever come up with enough mass. Yeah. Unless we, we got really good at like capturing asteroids somehow. That would be a tough thing to do because you would have to, you know, build something the size of the moon. Yeah. The moon's really damn big and it'd be really hard to do that. So I, I don't think we'd do that. I think what we would instead do is do what we were talking about before and, and somehow simulate a better life, right? have large, sort of like what they do in Antarctica. You brought it up, yeah. right? Sort of like what they do there. I mean, Brian Keating, you've had him on. He's gone to Antarctica. They they have done a great job making that place habitable in an otherwise unhabitable regime. No, very true. And you mentioned Phobos there. Very interesting, Moon. And, of course, you've got people like Buzz Aldrin who have pointed to this anomalous structure that almost looks like it's on Phobos. Any thoughts on that? The anomalous structure, which can you explore? Can you I'm explain gonna, that a little I'm more? I'm going to bring, I'll, I'll send you a link. I'll try and send you a link. It's, um, it's almost, I'm going to look at it here on the internet so I can show people what I'm talking about. But if you were to Google Phobos and structure, yeah, that comes up there. It's almost like, well, you'll see it when you Google it. It's yes. almost like a Let's monolith. See. And it was Buzz Aldrin one time said, you know, we should stop worrying about getting back to the moon and we should be investigating mm -hmm. what the heck this structure on Phobos is all about. It's a very famous interview. I think he gave it to C-SPAN a few years ago. So Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's it, it is interesting looking. I tell you what, there's so many bodies throughout our solar system that have these interesting. Have you ever heard of the bright spot on Ceres? Yes, I have. Yeah. The bright spot on Ceres yeah. is another one that's like, man, what the hell is that? Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff. My mind naturally tends to to be like, hmm, this thing looks like maybe an asteroid, an oddly shaped asteroid made impact with Phobos and kind of created this like protruding, almost cylindrical looking thing. But maybe the truth is even weirder than maybe I'm a NASA shill. I brought no, up the uh, don't NASA say that. badge back here. <laughs> don't say that. People will be calling us NASA shells, dude. And I know. I brought out the NASA badge because I know your viewers are big fans of NASA. Oh, yeah. And so I, that, was, that was given to me by a friend of mine who works at the Johnson Space Center down in Houston. So we got that on display. But, yeah, uh, it, that's certainly interesting. There's a lot of things like that that should be explored. Well, that could be explored. Absolutely. And, you know, back to our own moon before we venture to Europa after the break. I find it very interesting that our moon is so perfect. You know, you look at a solar eclipse and it just happens to be exactly the right size to give us that beautiful aurora that we see coming off the, the sun when it goes in front of it. Like you say, without the moon being there, it's almost perfect for life on this planet. In fact, without it, life might not be possible. That's oh, correct. Have you ever seen a total solar eclipse? Yes, I have. Yeah, I have. Luckily enough, it was just a couple of years ago. It was a little cloudy, but still managed to see it. Yes, I, it's it's incredible. And there's no natural explanation for that. No. There's no reason that the moon is just big enough to cover the sun. It's it a could strange have been, one. It could have been too small. It could have been much bigger. It's it's certainly an interesting thing to bring up. And, and I, pure chance, I guess. It's definitely really, really weird. But before we go to the break, we won't touch on Europa yet. I'll let you tell people where they can find your podcast, how they can keep up to date with you. Because like I said, when the last time you were on, I urge anyone who's into these topics to really follow what you're doing because you do bring on some of the biggest names when it comes to science and all the stuff we like to speculate on here. So let people know where they can find you, Brendan. Yeah, well... 
I encourage everyone to 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 reach to reach out, watch the podcast. It's called The State of the Universe. It can be found on iTunes, it can be found on Google Play, it can be found on And we'll be right back. Breaker. This is the Camp Baker Show. Brendan Drackler is my special guest here tonight, and he comes from comes to us from the Insti- the Rochester Institute of Technology. I got it right this time. Last time when he was on, I gave out the wrong university. But Brendan, we got cut off by the break, and I would love for you to share with the audience where they can keep up to date with your work because you have your own podcast. Yes, it's called The State of the Universe. You can go to thestateoftheuniverse.com. No spaces, all one word. Hopefully that's a good website name. Most of you can can get there. It's available everywhere. I mean, YouTube, Spreaker, Stitcher. I went out. I did podcast platforms that don't even exist anymore, I don't think. Like <laughs> Blubbery, Blueberry, is that that's one? I don't know if people use that. I just went out. I started throwing it everywhere. So you can find it wherever, Google Play, iTunes. I encourage you to listen. Next month, I'll have some of the biggest names I've ever had. I'll have some Nobel laureates on the podcast associated with gravitational wave discoveries. I'm just trying to grow. I'm just trying to 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 get good at this. I'm trying to get really good at this. I'm trying to give science an outlet. I don't think that it has been given a good enough outlet yet. I think that a lot of the people in charge of disseminating science, Kev, alienate a large population by assuming that they're stupid, by assuming that they don't know anything. And that's why you have these things like flat earth, that's why they grow, because you look in the face of people and you tell them they're stupid. You tell them they're stupid because they want to propose some alternate theory, when in fact education is the answer. I mean, I just don't think it's being done perfectly, and, and I hope to right that wrong. So yeah, check it out. Give it a rating. Give it a review. Five stars, or you suck. I mean, that's it, Kev, really. You know? Absolutely. If you don't rate the podcast five stars, you just suck. <laughs> And I'll be uh, getting that on the iTunes for sure. Such a brilliant way to download things and keep up to date with it. But before the break, you know, we were starting to venture further out into our own solar system. And one of the most interesting places that I think we both agree needs further investigation is one of the moons around Saturn. And there's many moons there, but this one is Europa. Now, we hear about Europa a lot. I've even heard NASA talking about the potential for going there on a mission at some point. Do you think this is our best candidate for finding mi- microbial life, some kind of life form below the surface? Yeah, actually, Europa's around Jupiter. Jupiter, but, okay. Uh, uh, see, there we go. I mean, they, they all have, you know, they have like 70 moons, so it's okay to to to, to mix them up every you now see, and then. See, we're learning all the time here, learning all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Now, yes, I think that Europa... I said this to you on the break, and and I, I stick with it. I think Europa is the single most interesting body if we're if we're in the business of trying to find life, and we're serious about that. If we actually want to say, I want to go find life. I don't want to just do what's easy. I don't want to just go to the moon. I don't want to go to Mars. No, I want to find life. If that's your goal, then Europa, I feel like, is the target. Now, should I describe what Europa is for the listeners, Kev? Yes, How please. Knowledge Absolutely. Okay. Take us, give us Europa 101. Okay, Europa is is a very interesting moon orbiting around Jupiter. It's one of the Galilean moons. It's one of the moons that Galileo actually noticed was orbiting around a different body. You know, this was sort of the final nail in the coffin that that knocked away the idea that everything goes around the Earth because Galileo looked out and he saw Jupiter and he saw these little bright spots going around Jupiter and he said, wait a minute. Not everything goes around the Earth. There's a system right there, and it has four little bright spots moving around it, the four Galilean moons. Now, all four Galilean moons are actually incredibly interesting, but Europa is the one, when you talk about life, Europa is the one that really sticks out. Now, what it is, is it's a big ball of ice, essentially. We know this because we can determine how massive it is, okay? It's a relatively easy calculation. Anyone in, in introductory physics in a university somewhere can use Newton's laws, coupled with Kepler's laws to determine the mass of Europa. Pretty simple. Now, when we do that, Kev, when we determine the mass of Europa, we can start to ask questions about it, like what is the density? And we, when we determine the density, we realize, oh, wait a minute, this thing must be composed mostly of water. If it was more dense, 
then it would be something like rock or iron. If it was less dense, then it would be some kind of gas, sort of like Jupiter or Saturn. In fact, interestingly, Saturn is, is not dense at all. And if you were to put Saturn in a bathtub, it would float. If you could construct some giant cosmic bathtub full of water and you could put Saturn in that, Saturn would float because it's not, it's so, it's so, it has no density. It's very, very, what's the word for undense? I'm, I, I'm escaping, like not dense, undense, I don't know, whatever, whatever that word would be. The, the opposite hollow? of dense, that's what Saturn is. Porous? Hollow? Maybe porous? I don't know. I, what, I've never thought about that before. Yeah, actually. what is that? Who knows? Who someone, knows? someone will come through with it. But anyway, Europa has about the density of water. Now, something else interesting is going on with Europa, and it's actually going on with all of the Galilean moons. And the interesting thing is that th it's undergoing a very, very tough tidal pool, a tidal push and pull, which means Jupiter's gravitational pull is literally tugging on the core of these moons. It's stretching and squeezing them. And the, the best example of that is Io, the, the moon Io. It's literally spelled I-O. It's a very interesting one. It looks like a big pizza. That's what it looks like. And Io is covered in this. It's the most active body in the solar system. It's got hundreds of volcanoes on it, constantly erupting, because the internal core of Io is so damn hot because of Jupiter's pushing and pooling all day long, all the time, for millions of years. Now, Europa is very similar, but Europa is made of ice, and it's much further away, so it doesn't get quite the same amount of pushing and pooling, but it gets some. And what that does is it generates a lot of internal heat. What does internal heat do? Well, it melts the inside of the giant ball of ice. And so what we think Europa is, is a shell of ice, and inside that shell is water. And not just water, Kev, but warm water. And that's what makes it so interesting, because water is a necessity for life as we know it. Now, we're going to talk about extremophiles here in a minute, okay? But we don't even have to talk about extremophiles when we talk about Europa, because feasibly, you could have perfectly normal water-bearing creatures inside of the warm waters of Europa. Because it's not like this thing is going to be super cold. It's melted. Melted water can't be too cold, right? It has a minimum temperature of zero degrees Celsius. It has to be above that. So it's a very interesting body. And I think NASA or any space-faring person, I don't, ESA, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, some private company, I don't care, anyone, should devise a way to go to Europa and explore what is beneath the ice. Now, that is a monumental task. It's a really damn hard thing to do. It's not going to be easy, but I think that we should be putting some focus on it, and we're not. Absolutely, and, you know, I'm just looking at some of the diagrams here, like a cross-section, and you you can see almost like the, the vents on the bottom, you know, per, potential vents that are causing the water to heat up. And we can see on our own planet, that we have some of the strangest life forms that are able to live down around these vents. In fact, it's conducive to, to life down there. And that's what makes this, for me anyway, such an interesting location because if life can survive and thrive at the bottom of our oceans with these volcanic vents and things like that, then who's to say it can't happen on Europa? Yeah, that's very true. We have This is a, this is a problem when we talk about habitable life. I think. I think it's a systemic problem. I think that too often we we put our, we back ourselves into a corner when we talk about habitable life because we can find organisms here on our own planet that live in the most extreme of conditions. I mean, we're talking about organisms that can live at negative 20 Celsius or even up to 120 Celsius. I don't know, Kev. Do you have you have you been to Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming? I haven't, but I'd love to go there. It's a beautiful – it's actually my favorite place that I've ever been to in my entire life. It is the most beautiful place in the world, and I think part of it is that you're on edge. You're on edge because it's a supervolcano. Yellowstone is a massive supervolcano, and I had Michael Poland, who, who is actually the person in charge of monitoring that volcano, the man in charge. He was on my podcast, and he assured me that I shouldn't be worried. It's not just going to blow up. There will be warning signs, but still when you're there and you're walking on the ground – and everything's active. I mean, you can see geysers. You can see these perfect pools of boiling water. You can't help but think like, oh, my God, is this thing going to blow up? Am I going to die? 
it's definitely like a, a real primal feeling you get when you're there, walking around and hiking. You're on top of a super volcano. But something very interesting happens in Yellowstone. What happens is in the, in the so-called Grand Prismatic Spring, and you can look this up, it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. What, what it has is a, a multitude of colors. I mean, in the center, it's crystal clear. On the outside, there's some orange hues. There's some different colors. These are caused by, in part by bacteria that live in the water. They live, it's boiling water, and they live in the water, and they cause those bright colors. So we need to be careful when we talk about what habitable is, and this was what you're getting at. We can find things that just live in the craziest of circumstances, and they seem to be doing just fine and thriving. So I think when we talk about habitable life, we need to be careful not to always search for humans because life can take on a variety of different of different ways of living based on the environment that that it spawned it. And so Europa might be an example of that. There might be some hell you might even imagine some intelligent octopuses floating around down there. You know, you could you could feasibly imagine that in the warm water. Could those octopuses feasibly or octopi rather? Could they feasibly build some way of communicating with us? Eh, probably not. Maybe though. Maybe I just don't understand enough about the life of an octopus because they are pretty intelligent creatures. Absolutely, and we can look at the intelligence of dolphins and whales on our own planet. And just because I, I like the fact you brought up that we shouldn't be looking for life as we know it, for lack of a better term. You know, life can possibly survive and thrive in many different conditions, some that we would not even pay attention to. We would think it was absolutely ridiculous for life to spring up there. And even this carbon-based form of life that we are, I've sometimes speculated, you know, and told people, maybe we need to open our minds because I like sci-fi shows, obviously. Brendan, I'm sure you liked them when you were growing up, and you hear about silicon-based life, stuff like that. And I think we have to open our minds to the potential for finding life that is nothing like we expect it to be. Yes, you're absolutely right. There are some synthetic biologists, uh, people biologists who try to create life synthetically, try to see, is there some configuration we can do in the lab that's different from what we know that can create life? Is there some way that we can spawn single cellular organisms some other way than, than they spawned in nature? And what they're finding is that, yeah, there's some unique ways in which nature can create life. Uh, I've, in fact, recently, please don't quiz me on this because I'm not a biologist, but I just remember reading sort of a popular article on this. Synthetic biologists were able to come up with four new pairs in DNA. So rather than the four that you're used to, the four amino acids that you're used to pairing, nucleotides, in fact, I think they're called, this particular synthetic biologist was able to come up with eight. So this creates a diversity in life that we haven't seen before in nature. But nevertheless, you can do it in a laboratory. And if you can do it in a laboratory, what's to say that the universe isn't doing it in its laboratory somewhere far away? So what do you think the likelihood is then of, in our lifetime, seeing some kind of mission launched to end this speculation, drill down beneath the surface of Europa and, and answer all of this? Do you think it's going to happen or is it a bit too far out there yet? It doesn't look good. I'll say that. I know that there is proposed missions to do a flyby of Europa. To Right now, we have... We have had spacecraft that have flew by the Jupiter system before, and that's how we know what we do know about Europa. I mean, we have pretty damn good pictures of it. You can find pretty nice pictures of it. And in those pictures, you can see striations across the surface. If you look up any picture of Europa, I'm sure you'll see them. These striations that, that go across the surface, and those striations may very well have been due to the fact that ice cracked at one point. The ice cracked, which let the subsurface ocean come up to the surface and refreeze. And that's why you have different colors. The different colors indicate the fact that the ice has frozen more recently than the surrounding ice. That's possible. And if that's possible, then there is undoubtedly a subsurface ocean and we should be exploring it. I, I'm not, I am not in agreement with NASA's sometimes slow undertaking of things. And of course, it has to be that way. It has to be slow because the funding is finite. 
right? In an ideal world, you would have unlimited funds and you could do a million projects and you could hire a million people and you could get shit done super fast. But I also think that NASA, and I'm a critic. In fact, if you watch my podcast, I am often a critic. I don't work for NASA. NASA doesn't pay me. I am not affiliated with them. They don't sponsor my research directly. They're certainly interested in what my research will show because there's people working for NASA that are interested in black holes, but they don't pay me directly. And so I, I am oftentimes a critic of NASA and how slow they go sometimes, right? There's this new lunar gateway that they're planning on doing. The lunar gateway is a space station that orbits the moon. I think it's a waste of time. I think you could spend money better by doing different things. And this is historically my stance. I don't think that there's many things that NASA does that, that I'm completely on board with. I love, Kev, I love that private industry is getting into aerospace. The fact that SpaceX is getting into aerospace. The fact that Boeing is into aerospace. All these different companies. Blue Origin, what is the one? Uh, yeah, Blue, Blue Origin, Origin or something. Amazon, yeah. Yes. All of them. I love it because you can see how damn fast they move. Private industry will always move faster. It because it, they don't have to put up with the bureaucracy, right? They can shut the doors. They don't have to talk to people, and they can get work done. And when they can do that, they can get a lot of shit done really fast. And so, one of the problems, though, with a, with private industry in space is that there's no incentive for them to explore Europa. There's no reason for them to do that. There's no money there. They're not going to find gold. They're not going to get paid to do it. That's why you need a, an agency like NASA, because these undertakings, a lot of scientific undertakings, do not give you a direct payout when you do them the first time. Okay, they pay you in in knowledge, but knowledge isn't money, right? And so we need to be willing as a society to fund something like NASA or to fund a space agency of any kind, so that they can do things that don't make money directly. I mean, we have to. I would. I would hope that that everyone would be in agreement that we would want to study Europa to figure out if there's life there. But there's no money in that, and so unfortunately, we have to rely on NASA to get there very slowly, very sluggishly. And maybe in my lifetime they'll get there, Kev. But I, I, I don't think it looks good. Even I don't they, think it looks good. Yeah, even if they get there, nobody's going to believe them. You know that, Brendan. People have just said. <laughs> Absolutely. Potentially true. Yeah, they've thrown NASA away. They just don't trust them at all. I mean, oh, sorry, just dropped something there. Yeah, absolutely, I see there's problems with NASA. And like you, I share your kind of um, almost, not anger, but frustration at the speed, the time it takes to do things. And it's interesting there you bring up the monetary aspect because you're spot on, absolutely spot on. And earlier on in the show, you mentioned the potential for maybe capturing an asteroid one day, making that into a moon for Mars. And one company that I keep an eye on they're called Planetary Resources, and um, they, that's their whole goal. They want to go mining asteroids, and there you go. There's a payoff there, Brendan. That's why they're striving to see if they can do that, because the profit on the other end, there's going to be money to be made. If only we could do things for knowledge as opposed to profit. Right. Unfortunately, you know, capitalism yep. runs the world, and there's no problem with that. No, exactly. I mean, it seems... Seems to be better than any other structure. Uh, but yeah, you, you need to make money. If you want private industry to do stuff, there has to be a payout. It's, it, it, asteroid mining is a really good example because that's going to be – I think that in our lifetime will be something that emerges, something that becomes really popular. And that might be the very first sort of space commerce. Space tourism might be the first. I think we're almost getting to that now where people can buy tickets to go to low Earth orbit. That will begin happening. But directly following that, I think we'll really get into the stage where we're able to begin mining asteroids. I mean, we have the Hayabusa 2 mission. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. I've not heard of that one. This is a Japanese mission, com completely done by the Japanese. And its its goal, well, it's actually already done it, is to land on an asteroid and return a sample. And the way it's going to do that is it's going to land on an asteroid. And it tried to do this before, Hayabusa 1. And Hayabusa 1 didn't quite work well. The reason it didn't work well is because they realized, man, we can't just scoop stuff off of an asteroid. Asteroids are really hard, and they're really cold. So you can't just you know, use a shovel. That's not going to work. So Hayabusa 2, very interestingly, actually lands on the surface, 
and shoots a bullet into the into the asteroid. The bullet breaks up the rock beneath it and and sprays a bunch of dust and backscatter into the air. And Hayabusa 2 collects the sample and then it flies away. It's very interesting. And when it gets back, if it gets back successfully, we'll analyze the asteroid and then we'll know what are asteroids made of in in the in the neighborhood. What are the closest asteroids made of? And if it turns out that they're made of something that is considered precious in any way, I think you will very quickly see private companies get their act together and begin missions to asteroids on the order of a decade. So what potentially is the payload on an asteroid? Why why do you have companies like Planetary Resources, like this Japanese mission you mentioned? What do they hope to find there? I think they hope to find it's it's different. It's different across the board. Oh, it's different in terms of philosophy too. Some people think, well, if we could start finding the types of resources we use here on Earth, if we could start finding them elsewhere, inorganic resources, we're not going to be finding oil anywhere, at least not that that I can imagine, unless we're going to Titan, which is one of Saturn's moons, and 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 that's a again another separate topic for a separate day. We can maybe find some resources that we use in abundance here for manufacturing, for things like that. And so then there would be a financial goal to go get those. And sometimes, you know, we have a finite amount of resources here on the earth. So eventually we're going to run out of them. And it's going to be a long time, specifically specifically for some things. Some things, I mean, the resources are almost infinite when we're talking about some resources, but not all of them are. And so you could have a philosophy that, you want to start using up the seemingly infinite resources in the asteroid belt instead of exhausting the resources resources on the Earth. Now, other people might say, well, I want to find precious metals. Could there be gold out there? There's gold in the Earth, which means there's probably gold in asteroids. We formed out of the same material. You know, there's gold. There's diamonds here. Could there be di- – well, diamonds is actually a bad example because diamonds are, are partially made with organic compounds, I believe. But the point is – you could find some precious metals. You could find silver, gold, things like that, things that have value. One of the interesting things, Kev, that, that I think would be really interesting is if we went to an asteroid and we realized, oh, shit, gold is really abundant, and then it loses its value. That's something that the the cynical side of me would, would find humorous. Yeah, absolutely. I share that um, humor of yours there. That would be quite funny. And one thing that we do know, or at least potentially we know that they're going to try and mine for in the near future would be helium-3. We hear about helium-3 on the moon. What's your thoughts on that? Do you think maybe that might be a good place to start mining, and then from there we go for the asteroids? Yeah, I'm not... I would like to see us get to the moon, set up a base on the moon... And I would like to see us do that before we start worrying about resources. I would like to see us get there. I would like to see them potentially build telescopes on the moon. I would like to see, I think a radio telescope on the far side of the moon would be fantastic. It's something that's been talked about before. You could easily put it inside of a giant crater. You don't even have to build anything. You just have to put a dish in there. You know, and a dish is pretty easy to construct. So I would like to see, before we talk about resources, I would like to see them start to utilize the moon more than they are right now. I would like to see NASA get a reliable way of getting to the moon and back right now, a reliable way to do it over and over and over again that you can do on the order of a day, two days, and we could start shoveling resources and people and technology there that we can then use to further our knowledge about the universe and to, to make commerce. I mean, I would lo- I would gladly buy a ticket to the moon. Oh, absolutely. If, you, if I could pay, if you have to pay 25 grand to buy a ticket to the moon, I'd buy it. I'll take it. You know, that's cool. I would love to do that. And again, I, I think it's probably going to be private aerospace that gives us that regular up and down to the moon in the near future, as opposed yes. to what we're seeing from NASA. And I like your idea of putting the radio telescope on the far side of the moon. Now, this is me, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but would that not be a big, huge help, as in we would be cutting out all of the interference that we suffer here on Earth? Yes. Yes, I've heard this proposed by a few people. I haven't heard it be talked about a ton, but it's something I always talk about. I would love to see it done. 
yeah, one of the problems with radio telescopes here on Earth is that everything we use is radio. I mean, you know, you use your cell phone. I, have you ever heard of Green Bank, West Virginia? Have any of your guests talked about this area? No, it doesn't spring to mind. Green Bank, West Virginia is home to the Green Bank Telescope. And the Green Bank Telescope is, I believe I'm still safe to say this, I don't think they've built any new ones, the largest steerable radio telescope in the world. I mean, you can look up a picture of it, Kev. The thing is massive, and it's beautiful. And it's in one of the most beautiful areas in all of this country that I'm in. And, and I was there a few years ago. And one of the interesting things about Green Bank, West Virginia, is it's considered a national radio quiet zone. What that means is... There's no cell phone reception. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no Bluetooth. There's nothing. You cannot use anything. Very few people live in this area. And we're talking, you know, hundreds, not thousands, hundreds only live in this area. And, you know, if you use your microwave for too long, these people that work at Green Bank will show up at your door and say, hey, we're detecting some interference from over here. Shut your microwave off. This is what we've resorted to in order to, to try to cut down on radio emissions. I mean, I was there, Kev, and when you show up, you have to park your car away from the facility, and they give you a diesel truck to use. And the reason they give you a diesel truck is because it doesn't rely on spark plugs. The spark plugs in your car interfere with the radio telescope. We're number two on today's Kev Baker Show, and I need to remind everyone out there, I was feeling kind of lonely at the start of the show today. The chat room was looking really empty. And that probably has something to do with the fact that last week, last weekend, the USA put their clocks forward. And because we are a US-based network, that means we adjust seasonally over here. So for the next two weeks, the Kev Baker Show, if you're living east of the USA, it's going to be one hour earlier. Over here in the UK, it's a 9 p.m. start, so please, please take note of that. For the next two weeks, we're going to be on at the hour earlier of 9 p.m. And today I'm joined by a returning guest and somebody I really love hanging out with and talking to on the show, Brendan Drackler, and he comes to us from the Rochester Institute of Technology. We're getting into space. Before the break, we were talking about this really cool telescope that I had no idea about. And Brendan, you were telling me, you know, if you want to use technology when you're in this location, you basically have to go into like a private secret vault, right? Yeah, there's this. So the, the entire building where all the technology is stored is in what's called a Faraday cage. And what that is, is it's like this giant, they have copper wiring running through all of the walls and all of the windows. I mean, there's no such thing as an open window at this place, right? Because if you open your window, there's still going to be this wall, these, these, wires running through it of copper. And the reason they do that is so that no electromagnetic radiation can escape and interfere with the telescope. It's all blocked. You know, it's essentially like the inside of a microwave. You know, when you look at a microwave, you can see your food inside. There's like these little holes in the front. Yeah. Those little holes are are just big enough so that the microwaves can't get out and hurt you. That's what the, that's, but you can still see your food. Visible light can still get out. The radio Radio waves work the same way inside of this Faraday cage. And so when you want to use a computer, I was telling you, Kev, that, you know, it's like a bank vault. You go, you step inside of one of these doors, and they shut this giant massive door behind you, literally like a bank vault. And then you have to walk in the second set of doors, and you can use your computers and, and send your emails and whatnot. But it's all blocked off. You're in a giant vault. You can't see out the windows. There's nothing. And the reason they do that is so that they can get really good really good readings on radio emissions of objects very, very far away because everything we use relies on on radio. And I was saying, and I'm not sure if this got caught before the break, but when you when you go there, they give you a, a vehicle to use that is a diesel vehicle because you can't use your own gas-powered vehicle, the classical one, because the spark plugs that are used to start the car emit radio waves, and those radio waves interfere with the telescope. And so they, they're like, all right, park your car. You can't use it. We'll give you a, a diesel truck instead to drive around the, the premises with. And, of course, we're talking about Green Bank Telescope. Now, what is it they're actually doing there then, Brendan? Is it are they looking for, like we hear, heard SETI with the wow signal back in the day? Is that the kind of thing that they're looking for there? Would they be the installation looking for fast radio bursts, stuff like that? 
they are not primarily looking for for e- any of that. What what they do mostly is they have a very user friendly system, and and people can can submit proposals to use their telescopes, and they can look at essentially whatever they want to look at, whether it be giant gas clouds. That's a very popular one in in the in the local universe, or they want to look at the center of the galaxy, or they want to look at a star, or, you know, whatever they want to look at, they they can submit a proposal. I know that one of the telescopes there, this is actually interesting, when I was there, this was a few years ago, and it might have changed since then, but I got to climb, they allowed me to climb with a few, with a guide and a few other people, the second biggest telescope there, and it's pretty big in its own right, I think it's called the 140 meter telescope, or maybe just the 40 meter, one of those two, maybe just 40, yeah, 40 meters is pretty damn big, I don't think it's 140, <laughs> Yeah, but so uh, these these metric units confuse me because the United States uses stupid units, and they've been hammered into my head by by the schooling. It's the same fact, as sh- um, it's the same as the fact we have different times of the year to put our clocks backwards and forwards. Why can't we just have some global standard if we're going to mess about with time? Oh, daylight savings time is the u- the most useless thing that we embark Isn't on. Isn't it just? It's, it really is. It. I just don't get it. I don't understand it. It's to maximize the amount of hours in the day that that yeah. it's bright out while humans are awake. But wake up earlier. Yeah. You know, you don't don't inconvenience everyone just so you don't have to wake up earlier. Especially it's, it's half the my, worst. Half my audience, you know, they miss the first hour of the show for a couple of weeks every year because of this pesky daylight saving stuff that goes on. It really frustrates me, dude. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those weird things that we do. As a society that we decide not to change, it's similar to using Fahrenheit in the United States. Yeah. I don't get it. There's no there's no real use. There actually is utility in it. I say this all the time when there's a little bit of utility in that I think Fahrenheit's actually a really good human scale in the sense that zero is really cold and 100 is really hot, but neither will kill you, right? In the case of Celsius, zero is freezing and 100 is boiling water. So 100, you die. Yeah. You're not going to be alive at 100. And zero isn't even really that cold for, you know, northern hemisphere standards. So Celsius is a good scale for physics, for science, because it depends on the boiling temperature of water. But I actually do think Fahrenheit's okay for human, human scale. Yeah, that that makes sense. And let's go back to this 40 meter dish then, because I I totally kind of derailed you there. What is it they're doing on the 40 meter dish? Ah, see, Green Bank was undergoing an issue. The issue is that NASA doesn't like to fund, or really the NSF in general, the National Science Foundation, they don't love funding radio telescopes. The reason they don't love funding radio telescopes, in particular NASA doesn't love funding them, is because you can do radio astronomy from the ground. So they consider that a a ground-based thing. They don't want to mess with that. You don't have to go to space for that. You don't have to go to orbit for that. You can just do it from the ground of the Earth. Now, of course, again, we talked about how there's all these emissions going around, our cars, our radio stations, all that sort of thing. But you can generally do it from the ground. Now, the problem with that is they have a tough time getting funding. And so Green Bank was at one point a national laboratory. It no longer is. It got decommissioned, if you will. It doesn't get the funding from the federal government anymore. So it had to start relying on private funders. And the Russians actually bought... About half of the year, this is what they told me when I was there a few years ago, they bought one of the telescopes. They were allowed to use it for essentially half of the year, and this is the small of the 40-meter dish. And they were using it as – as this is what the guide told me, whether or not it's, it's true. I, I cannot confirm nor deny that they were using it to study SETI. Uh, so that sort of answers the question you asked earlier. What are these things used for? SETI is a, a big one. SETI is popular. A lot of people try to – you know, listen in and see if they can hear any other civilizations out there emitting radio waves. Oh, I'd muted up there. Yeah, that, that that's pretty cool. And it's interesting to hear, you know, who is actually taking time on this telescope. And another new telescope that came up on the show not long ago, I'm trying to find the name of it here, but it was Brian Keating. You mentioned him earlier on. And I think he's working on a new project right now. I believe it's South America where they're putting together some massive radio telescope. Do you know anything about that? Uh, in South America, nothing comes to mind in South America. No. I, tr- I tried to dig it up there. I mean, we know he's worked on that bicep experiment down at the mm-hmm. South Pole, but I was trying to dig it up quickly. 
I'll try and um, dig it up before the end of the show, but I remember he was really excited about this new project that he was going to be a part of. And um, these radio telescopes, you know, are they going to give us the answer to what we were talking about earlier on? Could they potentially discover signals, life, mm. intelligent? Is that where it's going to come from first, do you think? This is an interesting question because it, 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 it relies on a lot of the things we did talk about. Why, Kev, do you think we insist on searching for SETI using radio telescopes? Do you have any ideas? Because we assume that any intelligent life out there is going to be using radio frequencies. Yes, because we did. Yep. Right? That's why. Because the very first sort of global communications we were using were done using radio waves. I mean, out floating through the universe right now is speeches given by Hitler, is I Love Lucy episodes broadcast in the United States. I mean, all of these things are just photons floating through interstellar space, radio waves that were emitted here on Earth, and they are just waiting to be intercepted, waiting to be read into a receiver in some far, far area of the universe. And so we assume that if there's some intelligent life out there, it probably did the same thing. It probably developed some radio telescope or some, some way of transmitting information with a radio wave and that we can intercept that and we can use that as evidence that there's something out there. And I think it was the late and great Dr. Stephen Hawking who said, you know, we have to be very careful because <coughs> when it comes to looking for alien life or sending signals out and trying to communicate with them, we could basically be sending out a menu for some hostile alien life that has not got our best intentions at heart, Brendan. That's right. So imagine, you know, go back to what I said, the I Love Lucy episodes. Imagine, you know, we're broadcasting this American sitcom, if that's even what it was considered, ac across the world and eventually out into space, and it's floating through interstellar space. And imagine that in the very, very far future, some civilization starts getting those. They're like, man, there's this real weird signal we're getting. It sounds like a bunch of people talking to one another. We don't recognize the language. Maybe they won't even recognize you know, what's going on at all because they might be some completely different organism, unlike a human. But nevertheless, they'll notice it's weird, and they probably will come to the conclusion that it's not natural. And when they do that, they will inevitably say, man, there had to be some kind of intelligent life out there emitting this frequency, and we're now picking it up. Well, imagine, Kev, that they're on the other side of the galaxy. What does that mean? Well, that means that in the time it took us to emit the radio wave and for it to be received by them, if they were on the other side of the galaxy, 150,000 years would have passed for light to travel that far. So if they come to our planet then, well, one of two things is, is definitely true. Either we're dead and we've killed ourselves long ago, or we are 150,000 years more advanced than we are right now. And that is a scary prospect for, for a civilization. You know, I mean, look at what we've done historically. Whenever we encounter a new tribe, whenever we encounter new environments, whenever we encounter new people, humans have this weird tendency to want to conquer them. There's always conflict. Whenever there is immigration, there is conflict. It seems to be a very, very fundamental aspect of our culture that we have not yet found out how to fix. It is a problem in many cases. It was a, originally a, a good thing. We used it as a defense mechanism. If someone comes into our tribe, into our land, or our instinct is to kill them. And that's a good instinct to have if you are an animal who doesn't live in a structured environment. But now that we live in a structured environment, we're trying to tussle with that and trying to figure out how to fix it. But the point is, if we, det if we detected some alien race, I mean, uh, 99 times out of 100, we're going to try to conquer them. And, you know, and like you said earlier, I mean, if we did detect some emissions from uh, intelligent civilization somewhere out there, the chances are, like you say, they're not even there anymore. Or if they are, they're entirely different to what we're picking up. Yes. And if they are still there, they are probably a very, very formidable foe, a very, very scary. Because, you know, look at how much technology has evolved in the last 200 years. Imagine how much technology will evolve in 150,000. Oh, 
And I mean, this is just our own galaxy we're talking about. And this is where the vast distances and time comes into space because our galaxy, one of billions, would you say, trillions maybe, who only knows? So, I mean, the space that we would have to cover to actually come into contact physically with these life forms, certainly not in our lifetime, right? Yeah, that's the thing that makes me excited about Europa and less excited about sort of alien life elsewhere, unless yeah. it's nearby. One of the interesting exoplanets we found is right next door. We found an exoplanet on the closest star to our own sun. Proxima Centauri has an exoplanet. So, I mean, that's only four light, four light years away. Is that the one that the billionaire Yuri Milner and Stephen Hawking was actually part of the project they were talking about sending like cubes, micro spaceships up there to see yes. what's going on. Yeah. Yep. That's the one. And so that interests me a little bit, but in terms of, you know, traveling across the galaxy, or as you say, traveling to other galaxies, I mean, I'm not interested in that so much because it's a goal that you could almost never see followed through as a, as a human being, unless they somehow download my consciousness and allow me to live for millions of years. I could never see the fruits of the labor. And so I'm a little less interested in that. Now, when we look at galaxies then on this bigger scale and you compare our Milky Way to another galaxy out there, are we quite standard? Do all galaxies basically take the same kind of shape? No, not quite. Uh, there's, there's different types of galaxies. There's beautiful spirally ones like the one that we live in. There is – and the neighbor to us, Andromeda, is a spiral galaxy, very similar – there's ones that are ellipti so-called elliptical galaxies, and these tend to be really big galaxies, and they tend to be really chaotic, and there's not a lot of structure. They're not they're, – they're more spherical than they are flat, and stars are moving all sorts of directions rather than in, in a uniform direction, and very chaotic places. And they might be the product of mergers. You know, It might be the case that if you merge two spiral galaxies, two nice structured galaxies, you get one of these giant elliptical sort of chaotic things. But there's a lot to be explored in that in that realm. But the point is, galaxies come in all sorts of different flavors, but not too many to lose track of. They are rather uniform. We have detected so many, and there's a so-called Hubble tuning fork, which you can pull up, which is a is a great way to characterize the the different types of galaxies that seem to be common throughout space. Now that, that's really interesting, and of course you are studying what happens when two black holes merge and black hole center of our galaxy here andromeda would that be the same then would the spiral ones have that black hole in common is that what gives it its shape no the black hole actually is we can't say this for sure because induction is a weird thing right you can't say that just because you see a a, a black raven every time you see a raven it's black doesn't mean all ravens are black right so it's a little tough to say that all galaxies have a black hole, but I'll say that there seems to be a relationship between the black hole that a galaxy has at the center and the the types of things that happen in the outside of the galaxy. I mean, there's technical relationships here that that I couldn't possibly discuss, but things like called the M sigma relation, if anyone's interested in really delving into this stuff. But the point is we can find these empirical relationships. And what these empirical relationships can teach us, Kev, is that – if there's a relationship, it's probably true that every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, regardless if it's an elliptical, a spiral, or whatnot. The spiral structure is caused by, by something completely different. It's caused by the fact that there's a lot of gas, and the spirals are almost like traffic jams where there's a buildup of gas. And these buildups happen rather naturally. If you put any sort of disk of gas and you make it spin, you you seem to produce these spirals. In fact, we even see spirals in young stars stellar systems, young stars that have, that have gas and dust around them, even they can develop spirals sometimes. And so this the spiral seems to just be almost like a traffic jam as things spin around the galactic center in a circle or uh, an ellipse. I find it quite interesting. We talk about as above, so below here. You talk about the spiral nature of the galaxies. And of course, our own DNA, it's got a spiraled nature to it as well. It's almost, you know, things on the micro level not exactly, but they mirror what's happening on the, the massive macro kind of scale. 
Yeah, there's a lot of of interesting things that you can get into when you talk about fractals. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the the I mean, I can watch some fractal videos and I'm like amazed at, you know, certain certain specifically biology. Like if you really can start to analyze biology with a microscope or a scanning electron microscope and really start to get down to the fundamental structure, there's some interesting fractal behavior there. There really is like an as above so below type of thing. And there's actually a lot of people that have been in my scientific life so far that were really interested in this fractal idea. I haven't been so interested in it, but there's undoubtedly something. There's some things that nature adheres to, some things it prefers. And it just might so happen that spirals are one of those things. There's something pleasant about a spiral, not just to the eye, but something fundamentally important about spiral structure. Yeah, and you, you, when you look down the microscope as well, you see on a cellular level, we've got the fact that you've got electrons orbiting around, is it the nuclei, things like that. It's almost like planets orbiting around the sun. Yeah, actually, the, the so-called Bohr model, which is the, the idea that an electron orbits around the nucleus of an, of an atom, uh, neutrons and protons. Yeah. This was put forth by Niels Bohr back in the early 1900s. And it taught us a lot of great things, but it's being thrown out now. And the reason it's being thrown out is because we understand a little bit more about quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics makes everything so confusing. But one of the things it teaches us is that electrons do not just orbit around the, the nucleus in circles. There is a lot of weird shit going on in the orbit. And it's some stuff that, that you really can't even picture. It's not simple circles. It's not simple ellipses. It's weird, weird behavior. So do you work with quantum scientists there? Because you're right, quantum mechanics is like the science of the strange, the science of woo, as I call it. Really weird stuff, but I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by quantum mechanics. What's your take on all of that? Yeah, I don't work with many, I don't work with many quantum physicists. It seems like the number of quantum physicists is dwarfed by the number of people working on other stuff. And I think the reason for that is it's so damn hard. It's so hard to wrap your head around these concepts, and I don't think anyone in the world has their head wrapped around these concepts. Some of the things that, that quantum mechanics teaches you, like some simple things like the structure of a white dwarf star, some of the most dense objects, or the structure of a neutron star. I mean these things, we still haven't figured them out completely yet. They rely on some underlying quantum mechanics that we just don't understand. Quantum mechanics remains to be one of the most important I don't want to say undiscovered because it's certainly been discovered, but one of the most important unexplained phenomena. There's a lot going on in quantum mechanics that we can't explain by invoking nature, right? We can't be like, mm, that makes sense. That makes intuitive sense. It makes sense that nature would do that. There's a lot with quantum mechanics where we're like, man, are we doing this right? There's got to be something simpler, right? There's got to be some simpler law out there. There's no way this could be right. There's a lot of that going on in quantum mechanics from my perspective. And I think it was Niels Bohr, correct me if I'm wrong, I could have butchered this, but I'm sure he said something along the lines of, if quantum mechanics hasn't shocked you yet, then you haven't understood it. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's said lots of quotes along that line. Um, I, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone understands it. I mean, you have some great people writing some great books about quantum mechanics, but you you can articulate it, but you lose it. You lose the fundamental nature of it. There's no way you can articulate quantum mechanics that I've encountered yet that gives the actual theory justice. And the reason is it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to the, the logical brain. It flies in the, the face of logic, really, doesn't it? It just totally contradicts logic. In certain aspects, yes. Yeah. It, it completely contradicts anything that, that you might believe. But one of the interesting things is how much we know about it, you know, because the math doesn't lie. And so even if we can't conceptualize the math, the math makes predictions and those predictions come true. And so now we're at a phase where we're like, okay, how do we communicate this to people when we don't understand it ourselves? That's a very, very good point. And, you know, we often talk about the double slit experiment on here, Schrodinger's mm -hmm. cat as well. And I find it's a really interesting topic to get people interested in science that may not have been interested before because of that weirdness. And, you know, hopefully that can lead them then to other stuff like people like yourself, stuff like that, because I think people really need to get back into science in a big way. 
especially in the year 2019. My son, he's 17 just now. We can see we're moving into this very technological era. And I think the more people we can get interested in science and really kind of really excited about it, even, Brendan, which I think you do. You make science exciting. Listening to you, you can tell it's your passion. You make it interesting. You've got a very open mind. And I think that's brilliant because, like I say, quantum physics is a good way to introduce people. I think you've got a really good way of presenting it as well. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that this stuff needs to be opened up to more people. More people need to be involved. And one of the stigmas with science is that it's not for everyone. This is a problem. This is a problem that many people believe, like, oh, I can't do that. That's too hard. That, I can't do that. I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be a roller coaster engineer. That was my thing, okay? I loved roller coasters. I would look at pictures of the roller coasters in the early stages of the internet when I had dial-up internet. I would love it. I would look at these pictures all day long. You know, I, I would it, ask my mom, please, can I look at like four more pictures? I want to look up <laughs> – I want to look up Nitro at Six Flags. I want to look up Millennium Force at Cedar Point. You know, I would obsessed. And then I convinced myself as a young person that I can't do it because you have to use math. I remember looking up on the internet, how do I become a roller coaster engineer? You have to use math. There's a lot of math. Okay, I'm not very good at math. This is fourth grade me convincing myself I'm not very good at math. And then I lost the passion. And I lost the passion because I convinced myself I couldn't do it. And then what did I end up doing? I ended up using more math than I would ever use as a roller coaster engineer. And, and you know, I only remember that I wanted that in retrospect. Somehow I lived, you know, a decade and a half of my life never recalling that memory, never remembering I wanted to. So the point is that if you want to do something, if you want to do science, if you're interested in something, there's an avenue to go about doing it regardless of where you're at in life, regardless of your, where you're standing, regardless of what school you go to, regardless of if you, you only got into a community college, whatever, there's an avenue for it. And we are almost on the break. You're listening to Brendan Drackler. You can find his work at thestateoftheuniverse.com. That's thestateoftheuniverse.com. This is the Ken Baker Show. Welcome back. Last segment, unfortunately, of today's Kev Baker show. I say unfortunately because this truly is a guilty pleasure speaking to somebody like Brendan Drackler. I urge you all to check out his podcast and his website over at www.thestateoftheuniverse.com. That's thestateoftheuniverse.com. Please check that out because, as you can tell by listening to Brendan, He's very open-minded, very knowledgeable, and some of the guests that he gets on there, in fact, all of the guests that he gets on there are going to be people that, if you listen to this show, you're going to absolutely love Brendan's. And Brendan, we've got one segment left, brother. I can't believe it's flown by so soon. Thankfully, you enjoy coming on the show, and um, after the show, we'll arrange another date speedily so we can get you back on, because this is a topic where there's always new information coming forward. And especially when it comes to the subject of something like exoplanets. I'm fascinated. I'm always looking for exoplanets in the news. You know, there's always news about that coming out, Brendan. Talk to us about exoplanets. What's going on there? Does that excite yeah. you? It does. It's almost as if it doesn't get coverage anymore, Kev, because it's there's so many. Yeah. It's like if at first, you know, 10 years ago, they would get covered whenever we would find a new one. Whenever we would find a cool new exoplanet, there would be a story about it. Now it's like old news. You know, you know how many ex do you know how many exoplanets we found? Could you take a guess? Could you wager a guess? I would say possibly now into the hundreds. F over four thousand. Wow. See? I remember it used to be big news. It'd be like a fanfare. Oh, we've spotted a potential yes. exoplanet. And there's oh, there's over three thousand that, that are sort of sitting in an archive somewhere waiting to be validated. You know, you have to have some human go through and, and, and try is, to figure out, is this a false detection or is this real? This is, um, I think we both agreed last time, this is an exciting side of artificial intelligence because that's exactly the kind of thing that AI loves, to pour over data, to look for patterns that we know about and even find patterns that we don't know about. And I've seen one um, report about how they had deployed artificial intelligence 
and it had actually returned results on a number of exoplanets that humans had missed. Yeah, there's a lot of... One of the problems with astronomy and astrophysics is how big the data sets are. It's really hard to get some human to pour through all that data and look at everything. You know, you talk about... Have you heard of Galaxy Zoo? No, uh, no. Galaxy Zoo is this website, and people can go on if they... I think it's still active. Galaxy Zoo is a place where people, everyday citizens, can go and classify galaxies. We've taken so many damn pictures of galaxies, but we don't have any astronomers that have enough time to sit down and classify them. So Galaxy Zoo exists where anyone can go on and, and they can say, this looks like a spiral, this looks like an elliptical thing, this looks like a merging galaxy. And AI helps us immensely in that field. It helps us work with large data sets that humans can't necessarily sit down and pour over and pour through, and it can do it at incredible rates, and it looks for correlations. One of the problems with it, of course, is that it looks for correlations. It doesn't look for causations. It doesn't look for some underlying principle. It doesn't look for some underlying mathematics. It just looks for correlations. So it's fantastic when it comes to classifying whether or not something is an exoplanet, but there are aspects of, of science where AI right now isn't, isn't doing so well. And, and, you know, when it comes to the exoplanets, we hear the excitement when they find one, again, I mentioned it earlier, that could be in the habitable Goldilocks zone, right? We get all excited because, oh, it's in just the right place, just the right, right. heat. But again, we're being very naive, aren't we? Because we're limiting ourselves to looking for planets that almost match ours, where any exoplanet, realistically, could have some form of life, even if we don't recognize it. Yeah, so right now we have 30 what we call habitable ones, around 30. So that number fluctuates based on who's giving it to you, based on who believes what is like Earth and what isn't. But yeah, we do exactly that. Well, I shouldn't say we, I'm not involved in it, but but astronomers do exactly that. They They look for something that is like the Earth, ideally in what we call the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone. Is it too warm? Is it too cold? Could there be liquid water? That sort of thing. Now, again... It's, it's using induction, right? We, we, it's like the raven analogy I said earlier. We only know of one raven, and it's Earth. Earth is, a, is the one raven we know, and, and we know certain properties of it. We know, for example, you could say that it's black. And so when we look out at the universe, we say, okay, we're going to look for only black ravens. And that's a maybe, maybe a naive way to look at the universe. I, I definitely think it is because... I think we have to open our minds and think bigger. We really need to stop putting ourselves in this box where we're looking for things that are very much along the lines that we have found here. And I think maybe then we'll start to find some of the answers, or at least potentially find some of the answers we're looking for. Yeah, it's really tough, though, because, yeah. you know, if, if you're not going to assume that life only exists on Earth-like planets, then you have to start asking yourself really hard questions to answer, like, okay, where else could life be? And then you have to start thinking up all these unique ways in which life could exist. And you'd probably come up with a lot. You'd probably be like, oh my God, life could exist all over. I mean, we look at Europa. Europa is a very, if, if we detected Jupiter, like some Jupiter-like planet orbiting around a star far away, by, we would say there's an exoplanet, it's not habitable. But what we don't know is there's a moon orbiting around it and underneath the ice on that moon could be life. So when we naively look for only these perfect planets. We do undoubtedly eliminate a lot of, of interesting places and potentially places where life could be thriving right now. Well, what's your thoughts on the subject of panspermia, where possibly life can be seeded, say, if an asteroid strike happened? Maybe like you were saying earlier on Mars, the, the water gets taken up into the atmosphere and it eventually evaporates away. Is there any potential for some kind of panspermia to take place where life from one planet via a comet, via an asteroid is deposited here or somewhere else? Could that be a thing? As far as I know, we have found certain bacteria on this planet that can survive in a vacuum, that can survive in certain really cold regions, that can survive in low pressure environments like space. So it's certainly within the confines of possibility that you have some asteroid impact and it throws rocks up into the atmosphere, or even a volcano uh, yeah. eruption that throws rocks into the atmosphere, and inside of those rocks is some bacteria, 
and the bacteria travels very far away and smashes into a planet somewhere else and and it thrives. Yeah, I I think that's perfectly possible. One of the problems with it is is how long it would take. You know, if you hit if you were to throw a rock from the earth, it would take yeah, millions of years. Yeah, because we were get... talking about light speed earlier on if you were to go yes. to like Proxima B, you're talking 4 years at light speed and we can't achieve anything like light speed yet. So, we're talking right. and a, a meteorite impact isn't going to achieve anything near it either. So, right, so that would be millions of years before that that organism could get anywhere. Interesting. And let's speculate, you know, about Proxima B, since it's one of the closest ones to us. We see Yuri Milner, he's wanting to go there. I mean, do you think, either in the near or not so distant future, we're going to discover some propulsion technique that can get us places quicker than we do now? Because currently... It's not it's not feasible for us to be going to places, especially not manned missions, Brendan, to the likes of Proxima B or further afield, right? Maybe Proxima yeah. B at light speed at four years, but doesn't Einstein say the closer you get to the speed of light, you, you kind of take on absolutely huge mass? Yeah, there. yes, yeah, yeah. The The point is, with, with Einstein's general theory of relativity... Uh, beating around the bush, the point is that you you can't achieve the speed of light. If you if you weigh something, you will not ever achieve the speed of light. It will take you an infinite amount of energy to get there, more energy that is in the entire universe. You you can't do it. So the best you can do is get going really fast. If we're talking fractions of the speed of light, maybe one third, one half. If you if you get really damn good, but I think what we'll really see is is nanobots. I think Stephen Hawking. Was it Project Starshot? Was that yeah, the, name, the technical the one, name? Yeah. Yeah. The concept behind that is pretty sound, and it's something that will likely be done if we ever go to another star system, which I imagine Proxima Centauri, or, or yes, Proxima Centauri will likely be the one that we go to first because it's the closest. We would be sort of silly not to. That's how we'll get there. We'll use nanobots. We'll send off a ton of them probably 100, 200 maybe, and we'll try to come up with some way to propel them at fractions of the speed of light. It's obviously much easier to get small objects. That's why the that's why the nanobot, right? You could use some sort of light sail technology, which uses energy from, from solar panels, essentially, to, to propel you at, at very high speeds. You could use that. And the reason you'd want to send out hundreds or, you know, maybe even thousands is because you'll lose a lot of them along the way. I mean, you're talking about a nanobot. If it collides with a speck of dust, it's probably done. You know, if it com if it combines with a, a cloud of gas going at, at that high of speed, it's probably not going to work anymore. So you want to capitalize on the numbers. You want to send a ton of them out, and hopefully, you know, a dozen, maybe half a dozen, will actually get to the target and be able to send back data or pictures or, or what have you. Yeah, I think it's quite exciting, you know, the, the nanotech aspect of this. And when I first heard about that, star shot or space shot with Yuri Milner and Hawking. I was really excited about that because it was something new. Uh, and when you read what they were planning on doing, it made a lot of sense. It wasn't out there. And again, it could return us the information we need without having to go to the speed of light, having to send people there. And again, nanotechnology excites me. It really does. It excites me too, specifically in this realm. Yeah. In, in being able to... to we're, we are too needy. We are too needy to send to other places. I mean, we will have a tough time getting to Mars. You know, you take you ever take your kids on a road trip, you realize <laughs> they have a tough time driving an hour. Yeah. You know? I mean, humans are not good at, at long-distance travel. We su If I ever have to fly internationally, I get so, so cranky. I hate it. I don't want to be trapped in an airplane. I don't want to be breathing the same air for hours. You know, let alone days or weeks. I mean, that just sounds like a horrible place to be. I certain, I, you know, we 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 need too much. We have to eat. We have to walk. We, if you could find some way to like subdue us, like you see in every science fiction movie, and put us in some vat of water, and then wake us up when we're at our destination, maybe that's a way to go. But for the foreseeable future, robots are the are the thing, the thing to do, the thing to use, because we just we require too much. Yeah, and I mean, somebody you might want to try and get on your show it would be uh, Dr. Craig Venter. He made a presentation at NASA Ames one year where he was speculating, hypothesizing about deep space travel. 
and he is obviously a genetic engineer, and he was talking about maybe tweaking our DNA, say, so that we don't suffer great effects from the radiation that we would be subjected to out in space. Sounds quite sci-fi. Do you think that might be a potential in the future? Yeah, we'll have to get really clever. Yeah. That's what we'll have to do. We'll have to get really clever. I, I almost don't think we will... I, I don't want to say never. Never say never, right? No, but exactly. I, I don't think we will ever get to a point where we're trying to send humans to other stars unless we can come up with some fantastical, what would at this point seem magical technology. We'll, we'll get a star. Yeah, we'll fire up a stargate, Brendan, and me and you will walk through the event horizon. We'll come out the event horizon instantly at the other end, and we'll be there. Yeah, that that's that's <laughs> what we'll have to do. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, we've talked we talked about this on the last episode that we did together, but it's almost, you know, due to time dilation, you know, even if you could travel at a high fraction of the speed of light and and get to Proxima Centauri in short order, when you come back to Earth, due to the effects of time dilation, due to the fact that you were moving incredibly fast relative to the Earth, which is moving incredibly slow, then your time would have ticked much slower in your frame of reference than here on Earth. That's a really complex idea, but it is an idea that we nevertheless see because we utilize it every single day in GPS. If we did not account for time dilation with GPS, our GPS would very quickly not work. On the order of a day, it suddenly wouldn't be very precise. And on the order of a week, it couldn't get us anywhere. Time dilation is a very real effect. We take into account time dilation when we do anything in low Earth orbit. And it is something that that complicates space travel because if you fly away, Kev, and then you come back and you were traveling long distances at, at high speeds, your family might not be around anymore. Your loved ones aren't going to be around anymore. Hell, you might get back and find the Earth went to war in your absence and no one's around anymore. So it's a, it's real weird. It's super weird. No, that's a really good point, and it's something that I've been aware of for years. You know, you, you hear about it in sci-fi stuff. You read about it all the time. And, and again, this is one of these things where sometimes I wonder if we are meant to go deep into space because, like I was saying to you at the start, it's almost as if we're attuned, we're toned or kind of tuned into this planet, you know? And like you say there, going away out at these speeds coming back, it, it's just not practical. Yeah, the only way it could be practical is if you put a group of people, 30 people or so, on a spaceship, and you say, these, these, this is your civilization now, yeah. just you, you 30. You'll live together, you'll spend your life together, you'll be on this little pod, you'll be traveling through space at very high speed, and when you get back here, no one you know is going to be here. It's going to be an entire new regime, it could be an entire new government, the United States could be gone, the space agency that you work for could be gone. You know, so this is your – these are your people now. This is your civilization. And and ship them off and let them live their lives. And, you know, I could imagine sending bunch, a bunch of these off in all different directions, and you have these little bubbles of civilization because that's the only way that you would have a way to, to have human contact because there's no way you could – I don't think you could psychologically deal with going away – and coming back, and, and all of the people you knew, and, and the world that you knew is completely different. That'd be I the, wouldn't expect anyone to do that. That'd themselves. be like the ultimate form of panspermia, wouldn't it? Sending like little pods of people out to go and inhabit other planets that they may come across that are viable along the way. Right, yeah. I mean, that that's that's like the, the only feasible way that I could imagine to to handle the situation and keep human beings sane. Because I would not want to, you know, you were in the military, Kev. I'm sure you had periods where you went away from your friends and family and and came back just years, maybe years or months later, and everything just felt so different. Yeah. Could you imagine decades or, or centuries? Or generations, yeah, gone. Yes. Well, let's talk about our own star then for the final kind of bit of this show because I've heard a lot of talk, and I know this isn't your area, or like your specific area. However... Talk of a grand solar minimum, and we mentioned ice ages earlier on, and we see more and more now scientific reports coming out saying that we could be entering some kind of cooling period. What's the score with our star, dude? Are we quite safe 
for the near future. What do you see happening in the short term as opposed uh, in regards to climate change, shall we say? Uh, well, I would, I, in terms of the, the surface temperature of the sun, I, th I think we're pretty safe. The sun is a G type star. It's pretty stable. We think and I always say think when I talk about scientific theories because, of course, they're right until they're not right, right? And so um, we think that we understand the sun pretty well, and we can make predictions about it. There's certain things about the sun that are nonlinear in nature, things like solar flares that we can't necessarily predict, things like sunspots that seem to, to happen unpredictably or on cycles that don't necessarily adhere to any period. There's some weird stuff, but for the most part, the sun is a pretty stable place, and we expect it to be stable for five billion more years, four to five billion more years, when it will eventually expand as a red giant star, and in the process, it will engulf the Earth. The Earth. But to answer your question, I, I don't think that you have to worry. I don't think that the sun is going to, to heat up or cool down in any way that's going to affect the planet. Well, that's good news. I'm glad to hear that. I really am. So we've got about seven, eight minutes left. What would you want to touch on for the audience before we go, Brendan? Because we've covered a lot of topics tonight. We really have. We've gone from extremophiles all, all the way out to, you know, going at light speed out into the universe. Where would you like to take us for the final kind of segment? Uh, I, I think it's a good idea to wrap this conversation up by talking about how we got here. Yes. Because how we got here is very interesting. How humans got to where they are today. One of the most interesting things, the thing that got me into astrophysics, the thing that got me into this field, the thing that, that motivated me unlike anything else was Carl Sagan's book Cosmos. But not just the book, a very particular section of the book, a book where he talks about supernovae. Okay? I think we've talked about supernovae in here before, Kev, maybe on the last episode. But if not, that's okay. The point is that certain stars, massive stars, much bigger than our sun, when they come to the end of their life, when they exhaust their nuclear fuel, what holds a star up to begin with? Why doesn't a star just collapse? Do you, do you know, Kev? Why doesn't, this, why doesn't the sun just disappear? Not sure, man. Educate me. Okay. Tell me. Okay. Well, the sun wants to just disappear. It has self-gravity, and the gravity wants to pull it into a really tiny ball a much smaller ball than it is right now, it wants to just fall in on itself, but it can't. And the reason it can't is because the sun generates a lot of radiation, and that radiation holds it up, radiation pressure. And those two forces balance one another out and create a ball. The ball wants to squish because of gravity, wants to expand because of radiation, and they balance one another out. Now, with really massive stars, there comes a point when the radiation can no longer counteract the gravity and it collapses in on itself in a supernova, and the star explodes. And when the star explodes, it creates the most massive elements in the universe today. We're talking iron. We're talking the carbon. We're talking the oxygen that we all rely on, the nitrogen. When the universe was born, it was essentially born with three elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Essentially just hydrogen and helium. You can't make people with hydrogen and helium. You just can't, and you certainly can't make the Earth with that. You need heavy elements, and you get those, Kev, by a massive star exploding, spewing those elements throughout the universe. And it's within the gas that is left over, the gas that is floating around in interstellar space left over from that explosion, that new planets and new stars form. And that's where we are. We're only here because at one point, a supernova in, its, in a the distant, distant, past went boom and when it went boom it created the heavy elements and those heavy elements the, the the iron in my blood the material that this microphone is made out of the material that the camera is made out of the carbon in your apple pies if you will it was all made from a dying star the very core of a dying star and whenever i talk about astrophysics that's the one thing that always captures my mind as carl sagan put it and i can't put it any better way we are made of star stuff now, that, that's really interesting to hear you talk about that, you know, that we are the product of some other star that collapsed in the, the very distant past. And then if we fast forward to the very distant future, then when our own star does do that same thing, 
that in turn could give birth to more life eventually because it will spew out these same things that we needed for us to form, right? This is when science always has a caveat, right? Ah. Because our star is actually not massive enough to produce a supernova. You know, that's like one of the things gently... that really shocks me. And for people out there, I think you can see it on YouTube. When you compare our star size to the other stars that are out there, we are absolutely minute. What? We're hardly it's, even relevant. It's incredible. It, it, you look up like a, a an, not an image, but sort of a comparison, if you will, to the star Betel, Betelgeuse or Betelgeist, depending on how, how you pronounce it. It's such an interesting thing. And that is a star that is very prominent in the night sky of anyone in the Northern Hemisphere. And that star could go supernova any day. We could wake up tomorrow and you would look up into the sky and you'd be like, oh my God, that's amazing. It would be as bright as the full moon, just right up there in the sky for everyone to see. And that's really cool. And that could happen tomorrow. It could happen next week. It could happen in, you know, 100 now, years. How but... far away is that one, Brendan? I'm not sure how far away it is, but but nevertheless, you would be able to see it. So You'd be could, able to see so it very could, evident. Could that have happened already, and we just haven't seen the light from it yet? Yes, absolutely, yes, because there is a finite travel time of light. So, yeah, in fact, I would, I think it's far enough away that it almost surely blew up. Wow. It almost surely blew up already, and we are just waiting for the light to get to us from now, that explosion. You mentioned LIGO earlier on. Is is that the kind of thing that they're attempting to pick up on when these stars do go supernova and they explode? We pick up some of, they call it the gravitational waves that are caused? There is certain gravitational wave detectors in our future that will try to pick up the ripples in space-time from a supernova. But right now, we're just at the phase where we can we can pick up gravitational waves put off by black holes merging. So when black holes merge or neutron stars merge, they have what's called a ring down. They spin incredibly fast. They orbit around one another in fractions of a second. I mean, you're talking the most massive objects in the universe orbiting around one another hundreds of times per second. That's incredible. That really and is. that literally puts ripples in space time itself. And we can detect those ripples with an uh, instrument like LIGO. Wow, that's amazing, dude. And again, I've been really, really, I can't thank you enough for today. I can't because I've learned a lot. I'm sure the audience have learned a lot as well. And um, we've even had a laugh at NASA, even though we'll be called NASA shells because we think the world is round and things like that. But that's yes. okay. I'm a round earth shell. I'll yes, admit it. I, I, I'm a globalist. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so before we go tonight, I have to give you a couple of minutes just to let people know where to follow you, where they can find you. And on behalf of myself and the audience, definitely please the best of luck with your podcast and come back and join us sometime soon. Well, thank you for having me, Kev. It's, it's a pl I love I love doing these. We mentioned it. I all happily I would do these every week. Uh, of course, again, my schedule would not allow that. But we'll, we we should do these once a month or something because yeah. I, I I love getting on here. I love talking about these topics. And to find me, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram. Really simple. I don't have a complex name. Thankfully, I don't have a common name either. So my tw my handle in both cases is at Brendan Drackler, my full name, no spaces, just one word. And I, mean, I know, very, very nice. And so visit there. the state of the universe.com, ladies and gentlemen. We're out of time. Until next time, wherever you are, make it TFR. <laughs>